Welcome to the Look Right Naked Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Bach, and today I have the pleasure of sitting down with Coach Brandon Hale. Brandon has added 70 pounds. Yeah, you heard that right. 70 pounds of muscle over the last year and a little bit of change. It's been an absolutely incredible transformation to see him go from being 7 to 10% body fat, incredibly lean for a long period of time, to commit full in towards bodybuilding and to building as much muscle as humanly possible. Beyond talking about the nuts and bolts of training and nutrition, we dig deep into recovery, and more importantly, the mindset. Because if there's anything that holds people back from really ultimately building the body that they want, it's being able to navigate things like their relationships. It's being able to stay focused on a goal and to do things even when you are not motivated. So if you're getting value directly from this podcast, make sure you follow Coach Brandon Hale over at Coach Brandon Hale on Instagram and check out his content. He is absolutely no bullshit, which I absolutely love his approach with everything that he does um, and has an incredible coaching program, Alpha Physique Fitness. So make sure you check that out. In addition, if you are gaining value from this, please share your episode directly on Instagram. Tag Coach Brandon Hale and me, Bach Performance, and I will pick one person to get a prize directly from Legion Athletics to support you with your training. All right, on to today's show. Well, Brent, today what I want to do, man, I want to talk about how to add 30 pounds of muscle because you have obviously added a lot more than that, you know, over the last uh, the last year. And like, let's talk about a few mistakes that people are making and we can just kind of roll into it. Yeah, yeah, it's been 70 now. I'm just, this is this is the last week of my push. We've been, my coach calls it a push bulk, basically. It's been 14 months, so coming up on 70. Like I, this is, for me, like it's bodybuilding. So this is my first kind of crack at a serious bodybuilding off season. So I hired a coach for it. I'd say that's been the biggest game changer, honestly, is, is having a coach. Um, I got a really good one who's like very kind of old school bodybuilding, like, not really gimmicky is very focused on like work hard so i mean the biggest mistake people make when it comes to building muscle is food that's the biggest kind of player in it is how much food you eat um, obviously training really hard as well so the biggest thing that's been different for me over the last year is just staying super consistent with the food um, a mistake that i made for a while like because a few of the bulks that i've done before that have gone pretty well the problem with those is i got too fat too fast is yeah. keeping the food clean. So before I was very flexible and like I would hit all my macros and I always figured, you know, that's the most important thing, which it is, but quality of your food is also very important. And I kind of used to skimp out on that, have a lot of like cheat meals, like three, sometimes three cheat meals per week and I'd fit them into my macros. This yeah. time around, I've treated uh, my diet like, like I'm doing a fat loss diet where like I'm picking all healthy whole food and that that has helped definitely keep the body fat down and then you keep the body fat down that extends the length of time that you're going to be able to to build muscle for so yeah that's huge man you know as somebody who i mean let's reflect back what 14 15 months ago when's the last time i saw you we were in las vegas and we we're probably a, a very mexico. similar frame mexico mexico yeah. mexico yeah and you were just kind of on the beginning of your bulk at that yeah. at that point and so now we're fast forwarding you've added 70 pounds that's incredible, man. Mentioning the food component and the big mistake a lot of people make is being a little too flexible, having a few too many cheat days. And, you know, by and large, I would say a lot of the people who are looking to build muscle are inherently were thinner guys and women to begin with. And it's kind of led them in this. And one thing I've also noticed with it, you know, I'm 34 now, is even though I still stay in, in good shape, it is a lot harder when you have more of those cheat meals really come in. And I think one of the battles that people face at the same time is, you know, by and large, as you get older, tend to have a little bit more stress at the same time. And so we have this kind of interesting point where physiologically speaking, our body's probably not as optimized to be able to handle the shit, you know, some of the shit food that you can get away with when you're younger. And at the same time, we need to focus on, you know, dialing in all the details on the edges, especially if we want to build significant size. And so being that you've added 70 pounds, right? Like what was that ramp up process look like? What were like what your maintenance calories before and like how did you gradually increase was it hey i'm gonna go for this all of a sudden we're gonna spike things up by five six hundred calories a day or was it a, a gradual climb for you gradual for sure prior to when i started the uh, the bulk i'll just use I'll, i hate using the word bulk but yeah <laughs> I'll, I'll just keep using it because most people don't get what push means prior to that i was super lean and i just kind of stayed lean and got kind of leaner and like more full looking over the course of like over the course of probably like four or five, six months. Like I did one cut and then I went back to maintenance and I did another cut, which was the leanest I've ever been probably because I did two in a row. But then we slowly ramp up back up 
And obviously when you finish a fat loss phase and especially when you finish a fat loss phase where you're super lean like that, like below 10% body fat, you have to do the reverse diet. When you're that lean and you do the re reverse diet nice and slow, you end up looking leaner and more full as you do it, right? Because you're, you're, you're probably in a, in a decently big deficit and you kind of remain in a deficit as you increase the calories. So essentially we just, I think the lowest my, my calories got when I was like super lean in summer 2022 was maybe like 2200 calories ish. I don't remember like exactly, but it's definitely around there. And then at the end of my reverse diet. So when I got back to like my new maintenance, I was probably at like 2600. Um, and then to start the massing phase, we maybe started at like 300 or sorry, 3000 to 3200 ish in that area. So basically like, and the way that I like to do this with clients, like I, I really like having things, having like rules to things is I always increase calories by about 0.8% in the reverse diet. When you're massing, that can be maybe a little bit higher, but um, yeah, you always want to be in control of that. Like if you do too big of a jump and body fat starts piling on, like you can't really, now you, you don't really want to have to go back and like adjust for it. Right. So it's way better to, yeah. to make small incremental changes. And actually my new coach has actually, his approach has been very, very slow or not very slow, but small changes. So he might be changing the diet and adding food, at least in the beginning, like on a weekly basis, but they were like 100 to 150 calorie increases. You know, it's really interesting, right? How small those shifts can be, but over time, how they stack up and where a lot of people will say, Hey, Hey, I got to my leanness, right? Like I had a client asking me about this last week. He's like, Eric, when I finally get to that body fat that we're looking for, we're trying to gun for 10 to 12%, he's never, never been down there. How long until we start building muscle again? And my advice to him was, well, what we have to be able to do is we have to be able to sit there for a little bit and very gradually increase things up because when you are lean, your body is most likely to add more body fat. Um, the description I like to use is we don't necessarily lose the number of fat cells in our body unless we have a surgical intervention. What they do is they shrink down. And so what we need to think about is these fat cells, imagine you're coming off a cut, is basically an empty grocery bag. And so if we just start piling into calories right away, well, those things are going to expand. They're going to build up very quickly. And what we want to do, as you mentioned, is these gradual shifts and improvements. And so when it comes to going from a place where you're lean to gradually emphasizing that muscle building process, it's not about spiking calories as high as you can and just saying, hey, you know what? Time to bulk up. We got lean. No, your body is going to backfire. Your digestion, everything is going to is going to fight you. And so it's been really interesting to hear that approach for these small adjustments, 150 calories here and there, and what kind of led you to where you are, you know, 70 pounds over the last, you know, year plus. Yeah. And that, that's always, uh, that's always uh, a tough sell telling people that they have to hold the look kind of thing and like maintain, but maintenance is kind of like a boring word, but I mean, you'll still, they'll start building more muscle right away. Right. Especially if the, the training is hard. That's when you, that's when you look your best is when you're at the end of a cut and you work on holding it. If you're, if you treat that holding phase, the maintenance phase, just like you did your fat loss diet, when it comes to like discipline and adherence, that's when you're going to, you'll keep looking better and better. So people should be kind of most excited about that part of it. When in reality, people tend to turn their nose at that part of it. Right. Yeah. Well, mentally, what would you recommend to somebody who is going from a place where they've lost this weight and now they want to start bulking up because having been there myself and fallen off the deep end, you know, going out, partying, eating way too much after doing a photo shoot and all this stuff, what would you recommend mentally to stay dialed in? Because every single like sense in your body is saying like, give me more food. Let's like wrap this thing back up. And you've worked so hard. And many times people will love the food aspect of, you know, just like the connection that it brings and the enjoyment they get from it and want to spike that back up right away. Is it something where it's like, you have one enjoyable meal and then you're kind of back on plan. Like what does that look like specifically? I mean, it, it all just comes down to like what I mentioned, right. And, and what, what you're talking about as well is like, I think understanding before, before you even start that fat loss diet, that once the fat loss diet ends, you almost have to take it like more seriously, or at least just as seriously as you took the fat loss diet to ma to maintain. Um, so it helps knowing like well in advance, but honestly, for a lot of people, they kind of, it seems my experience, at least most people kind of have to learn that the hard way. And it takes kind of years. Like I think like you and I, we've both done many bulks and cuts. And I think you'd agree that each time you do one, you just, just from experience, you get that much better at it just because you kind of understand from each time you've done it, the mistakes that you made in the past. Right. For me, a big thing was, uh, really, uh, 
kind of taking an inventory of like how the different ways that I feel like when I'm super lean, especially for that long period of time, like in 2022 that I stayed lean, I just felt so amazing all the time. And, uh, and during that period of time, actually, I had basically no cheat meals at all. And the motivation behind that was like, uh, I had uh, in my memory, like I could easily recall, okay, if I have a cheat meal, this is how I'm going to feel after. And it's, it's not good, especially like when you're super lean like that and you're very used to eating super clean and just feeling really good all the time. So that, that's the biggest thing is like, I kind of like procrastinate. If I really feel like having a cheat meal, I'll try to procrastinate on it. And, you know, maybe in my head, I'll, I'll give myself the permission. Okay. Like if you really want one, you can have one, you know, and then just maybe, maybe, I, maybe I won't though. And then I usually end up making the decision, ah, screw it. It's not, it's not going to be worth it. Right. But most people, when they, when they start thinking of having like a cheat meal, off plan meal, whatever, right away decide they're going to do it. And they start they, they allow like the dopamine to kick in, right? Because they've decided that they're yeah. going to do it. And now they're looking forward to it. They're planning it out. They're thinking about how good it's going to taste, et cetera, right? So um, just being very aware of like where you're at, how you feel as a result of how well you've been eating and how lean you are, being able to kind of recall how you feel when you have a when you have an off-plan meal, a binge, you eat a bunch of junk food. Yeah, it's having that foresight to not give in to that immediate gratification that is really coming with it. Frankly, if we could sum up, the ability to lose fat, build muscle, look great naked. That is the number one skill that you can develop when it comes to your approach to nutrition is to not give in to that immediate gratification and instead have the foresight to look and be like, how am I going to feel here? And one thing within my coaching, we start people pretty aggressively when it comes to fat loss because they're dialed in, they're mentally focused on it. And once you start reintroducing foods again, they built that kind of foresight of like, wow, I feel so good now. I don't want to mess this aspect up. And it's yeah. kind of a give and take of like developing the sustainability aspect that they're potentially looking for with that. We've talked about, you know, your transition now from, you know, from being very lean, holding that for a long period of time, you were walking around nine to 10%, nine to 12% for about a year. Uh, not about a year. Like I was probably like 10% for, cause yeah, I did a cut that ended in for a photo shoot that ended in February. Then I kind of went back to maintenance and then I started another cut in June. So it was like between seven to like 12% body fat for like, what is that? I don't know. Um, uh, eight months, February, through yeah. September. And so for you, how much of a difference do you think does that make for someone to be able to not just get lean, but be able to stay lean in terms of how well they can add lean muscle because the biggest issue I see a lot is like, you know, especially say you get like a, a message on Instagram, someone's like, Hey, I want to build muscle and lose fat, man. If you're 20, 25%, that's not going to work too well. It makes it a lot easier because like the, the, your best friend, when it comes to building a lot of muscle, one chunk of time, like I have over the last year is how much time you have. And the only thing that's going to limit your time when gaining muscle is you gaining too much body fat and your health starting to deteriorate. So when you start super lean, that gives you way more time that you can spend adding muscle because your body fat's going to increase no matter what. So that that's by far the the biggest thing. So, and I know that that, that can be a tough, another thing that's a tough sell to some people because they want to, people who want to look muscular, like in their mind, that means they have to start building muscle now. Right. But, um, I've always, I've always had the belief that the, the best thing to do is get as lean as you can first, because then it gives you more run runway to do one, at least one big, uh, long bulking phase. And that's, that's the best way to build a lot of muscle in a short period of time. Yeah. People tend to underestimate how long that process really takes to build a substantial amount of lean muscle. And it's a lot longer process than it is to get lean. So much of it is having the patience to get to the point where you can do it effectively. It's like doing the, the pre-work before you can really start adding that size in a way where it's going to be healthy and sustainable and practical for you long-term. How did your training change as you started to ramp calories up? We're kind of out of this reverse diet phase now. Now we're fully in that push in that in that bulk. Did you start training longer? Like what was your training split? What, what are some of the details here? Basically, like I just add as I feel I can. Like I was, I was kind of uh, when I was very lean in in, uh, in the summer of 2022. I was kind of making the decision whether or not I wanted to fully commit to bodybuilding. So I was kind of trying to prove to myself that I could sustain kind of training and living like a bodybuilder. So the the main difference was just training harder, so just higher intensity. Um, and that's kind of been the biggest main difference is like basically before I I took the approach of like I would within my my training phases I would start like a little lighter when it came to intensity, I'd leave more sets in the tank and then I yeah, ramp yeah. up toward the end of a phase, train to failure and then take a deload. Now I train to failure uh, at least 
once for each exercise I do. So at least on the last set of every exercise right now, it's pretty much like every set I'm trying to take to failure. So that the main thing is a lot harder. Secondly, because I have, I started with clear weak points and they still kind of are weak points, although they're, they're a lot better now is I focused, I focused the mo most of my volume on my weak points, which for me is back and chest. And then it's kind of, it's, it's, uh, I've learned a kind of a lot about the balance between intensity and volume. Sure. Like you'll, you'll gain more muscle with, with higher volume, but as you get bigger and stronger, then you have to start tapering the volume back because now that volume becomes a lot more effective um, and harder to recover from because you're getting better with your technique and your intensity. So at first we ramped up the volume uh, quite a bit, especially for those lagging muscle groups. And now I'm, I've slowly started to tape some of the, taper some of that volume back because now it's becoming hard, a little harder for me to recover because it's the volume is so much more effective because I'm so much bigger and stronger. Yeah. I mean, that's a huge piece of it, right? And I think if we want to look at it from one way, when you're getting started, when you're not as advanced as a lifter, increasing the volume is going to be a very crucial component. Um, and this is, of course, if you're already consistent, but even with my training as well, a lot of times now it's like two very top end sets, right? It'll be ramp up, ramp up, ramp up, and then one or two where we're just taking it, you know, really to the point where we can't anymore. And that's been the biggest difference as well. Um, you know, for the average gym goer, how much of an impact does their external stress have on their ability to recover from higher volume training? Because I'm sure you see a lot of crazy stuff. I'll, I'll see somebody's workout, you know, they're training like an IFBB pro and, you know, they're 36 years old. They've got a lot of stress at work. Consistency has always been an issue for them. But then they try to do, you know, five all out sets of, of 12 reps, you know, like it's, you know, one of the muscle magazines from 1999 and they're always getting crushed with injuries. What do you find? in regards to, you know, that sweet spot between your ability to recover and what your training volume looks like. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely crucial. I, like if I think what, what ends up happening is when people train like that and their programs look like that on paper, like their stress management recovery, their sleep is brutal. I'm sure if we watched them train, we'd be like, the intensity is probably not there. Right. So, cause there's no way someone could train like a bodybuilder and just have brutal, like stress and stress management and recovery, right? You just, you wouldn't be waking up in the morning. You'd be, <laughs> you'd be hitting snooze, right? Sleeping through your alarm. So yeah, it's, it's crucial. So it it'd definitely be a good idea if, if, uh, if you, you feel like you're in that place where you're stressed all the time, you're always sore. Uh, you know, you're afraid you're going to get injured when you're training to really taper back the volume and focus purely on just managing your stress and recovery. Even could, it could even be a good idea for people like that who have just been hammering in the gym to take maybe multiple weeks completely off the gym all at once so they can gain control of managing their stress and, and recovery and getting sleep on point. Because yeah, like at that point, at that point, if it's bad enough, like you're probably, you know, losing muscle and you're almost going backwards. So that all that time and effort you're putting into the gym is giving you the opposite result that you want at that point. So that's just how crucial it is. Yeah, one perspective I like to have is, you know, what's the biological cost of what you're doing? Because if you're not recovering from all the work that you're putting in, the way I like to think about it, like you're just putting miles you know, on your joints on everything else without the actual payoff for what it is. And so people a lot of times are alarmed when they see a workout i'm sure you see this with your clients they're like i thought there was going to be more sets i thought it was going to be longer i'm like no but what we need to do <laughs> yeah yeah and like so much of it is like teaching people how to be able to train close to failure even if it's one or two reps in reserve but do so in a safe manner where they get comfortable really with that process as well but you know one thing i've noticed and feel free to elaborate elaborate here i feel so much better when i do have that lower volume approach where it's like one or two sets that can mentally gear up for, but I do take them really to failure, right? Whether it's yeah. like, I like to do a double progression, right? So if like an eight to 10 rep scheme, and if I hit that 10, I'm gonna take a 15 second rest and do a rest pause and hit another three to four reps, right? It's like my strength is exploding with it. But you know, being able to find that balance in terms of how hard do I need to push this, but how can I do it as safely and as effectively as possible? Yeah, and that, that's why it's so important to have to get professional help obviously you know we're both gonna agree on that because we're both coaches but it's it's so true like like, like i said I, I just had that yesterday with a brand new client he looks at the leg workout he's like i'm not used to doing a leg workout that's like this short and with like not this much work uh, are you sure you don't want to add more and i'm like <laughs> well just wait i'm like just wait until you send me your videos and i give you feedback on your intensity there hasn't i don't think there's been a single time where i've got uh, training videos from a client where their technique and intensity doesn't need a ton of work. The first thing, the first thing you want to, you want to make sure is, is as dialed as you can get it is your technique. 
Um, and then push the intensity because if you don't focus on your technique first and you start trying to push to failure, that's how you get injured. And chances are like increasing the quality of the technique, the, like having the right tempo that will in and of itself make your training suit like way more intense. Right. Cause so many people like, yeah. for example, leg press, like people don't go past 90 degrees on their knee joint for leg press. And it's like, that makes it so much easier. Like even if you even if you fill the whole machine up with all the weight that I can hold and do, you know, a 30, 40 degree or like 60 to 80 degree range of motion, that's still way easier than having less than half the weight you're putting on it and doing a full range of motion where your calves press against your hamstrings. Yeah, you, that's, that's basically like kind of the balance there is like, and I guess the biggest thing is get an outside perspective. I'm sure even if you filmed your own sets yourself and just analyze them yourself. Like you'll, you'll see where you're, where you're going wrong. I catch myself there all the time, you know, and say if we're at an event or something like that, and I train with somebody, I'm thinking of a training session I had with our uh, mutual friend, Frank and out in <laughs> Las Vegas. Right. And, you know, push me well outside of my comfort zone on a yeah. lower body day. And I'm like, you know, sometimes you have to tap into something that's a little bit different, you know, I'm so I'm sure you had the same thing when you started working with your coach. And there's so many times when you just kind of get used to training and looking at a certain load, but you kind of have to take a step back and be like, am I really taking this to the point where I'm one or two reps or even completely at failure, if you can do it safely and effectively And for the vast majority of people, the answer is no. One thing, you know, I've seen is like, I've seen high volume programs work. I've seen low, low volume. One thing I have seen regardless though, is like the people who train incredibly hard with good technique, it doesn't really make a difference as much as the fact that they're pushing their muscles to the point where they're forcing that adaptation to really take hold. And yeah. I think that's the biggest thing that I've seen in terms of a difference and even the growth in my own, my own personal training. Yeah. And, and something trending right now is Mike Menser, right? Yeah. Um, I, I just, I just filmed a video on him, but uh, yeah, a lot of people getting like, like it's very, there's a lot of buzz around that right now and people really like what he has to say, but I think, so there, there's a balance. Like most people don't train hard enough to make that work. Cause that's the intensity side of the, the volume versus intensity argument to the extreme. So yeah, there, there's definitely a balance, like more volume when you aren't able to, to fully take that technique and, and, uh, intensity to, to the max is important. Cause that's at that point, volume is practice for you to get better. But yeah, once, once you get to the point where your technique is good, like you're not gonna right away, you're not, you're gonna know you can't, I can't do this much anymore. Right. So, but yeah, the, the that's the biggest thing is like self-awareness. If, if you're not working with a coach for sure, like being able to really keep yourself accountable and like, look at what you're doing objectively and asking yourself, am I really doing the best that I can? Where can I be better for a lot of people? That's hard though. Right. Cause your, your ego gets involved. You've been doing it for so long. You know, you, you think, you know, what's best so it can be tough. And it, it was even tough for me when I started with my coach, uh, you know, uh, just over a year ago to get his first training feedback. And I've been doing it for 10 years and I'm like, damn, I, I'm really, I really have to make this many, this many changes. I've really been doing it that wrong, but it's just, it's just a result of not fully analyzing your, your performance basically. Yeah. And that's the beautiful thing about coaching, you know, regardless of what it is, whether it's you know, fitness, business, any, anything along those lines is getting that objective feedback. We all have areas that we can improve and it's being able to be open and receptive to it and to be able to, in some cases, commit to what you're being told without all the answers being 100% transparent and available to you yeah. right away and yeah. trusting that process. Is, is that something that you personally had to battle a little, little bit? Because listen, I've got your Instagram over here and I can see your photos of you at 79%. Like, dude, completely shredded. You know more than 99% of people about getting an incredible body already at that point. It had to be really humbling to go through this process and now in the back end looking like, well, I've gained 70 pounds. Like, tell me a little bit more about that perspective. Yeah. And that's why like the coach that I found is, has been awesome for me because he looks at things a lot differently than I do. Like I just posted my, I'm in the last week of our, our long 14, 14 month bulk. And I posted the before after. So one, one photo of me at 160, one photo of me at 230. Now I feel big, like this is the biggest I've ever been. And I, my coach replied to the story and he's like from skinny to less skinny. <laughs> so, so he's still like, you can do still, my Yeah. You got to get bigger. And yeah, his approach is so different than mine. He's very, like I said, old school. Um, and of course, like not everyone has to be this strict for sure, especially if you're a lifestyle, but like he, he wants me eating six times per day. He wants every meal to be whole food. So like, if it was up to him, I'd be eating chicken and rice six times per day. So I kind of totally old school. Yeah. 
Yeah. So if I kind of meet them in the middle, I have maybe three, four meals, chicken or rice and the other meals or things that are a little kind of easier for me to get down. Yeah. A lot of the things that he's told me to do, like I kind of like, I think this is how you should feel about your coach. If, you know, if you really care about results, like sometimes he tells, uh, but then once I see it through and start getting used to it and see the results come from it, I'm like, okay, I get it now. And, and I, and I appreciate that. So, so you, you want, you want your coach to make you feel like that and push you. Obviously you don't want to completely trust blindly, but like at least, you know, the reason you hire a coach is not to tell you what you already know and are comfortable with doing. The purpose of having a coach is for that coach to push you out of, outside your comfort zone. So you can, you can level up, right? Yeah, definitely. And that's, that's what you need to have. It's about having that person with a unique perspective and skill set to help you do something you have not quite been able to do on your own. One thing, one thing that you you posted this a couple of weeks ago that really, really stood out. You mentioned, here's a simple hack to get you stronger, leaner, more muscular, healthier, and happier. Never let someone who's fatter, weaker, less muscular, unhealthy, or happier than you influence you in any way. Personally with you, right? Like, did you receive any like external friction? Because a lot of people, I think, when they look at coaches, they're like, hey, yeah, well, you do this all the time. Like you can navigate all this stuff perf perfectly. Did you have any external friction from other people who weren't necessarily supportive of you? Either at this point or when you first got into incredible shape when you were, you know, seven to 12% body fat? Yeah, uh, definitely a lot uh, early on. And it, it'll, it'll never completely go away. Like, like spe more, most specifically now it's just family members. Cause I, you know, you can't, you can't choose your family. And I'm not like basically everyone else who, cause this is, this is like my life, right? Business and bodybuilding basically. So anyone who I can choose whether or not I'm close to, if they, if they, uh, make me question what I'm doing at all, they're like, see you later. So mostly right now it's just family members. Like my parents are like, why the hell are you getting so big for? Like you look just, just, uh, last week, my Nona, which is grandma. She was like, you look like shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, Giving but, you the business. Yeah. Yeah. Cause she, cause she knows, she knows it's unhealthy. She's not dumb for, from a bot like bodybuilding. But yeah, before that, like I used to work in the trades. So in the trades, you know, the mindset's kind of like, ah, fuck it. Like when, when's Friday count down the days till Friday, drinking on the weekends, people will, will, will kind of make fun of you in a friendly way, but it, it still will get to you. Um, but yeah. So, so that, that's what I had to deal with early on. Like when I first started training, I was an electrician and that's the kind of people that I was surrounded with. And I think I was pretty good at that, uh, at kind of looking at it as like right away, as soon as I started getting that, those kind of comments and, uh, I just think to myself, like, you know, what, why does this person's opinion matter at all? Like, do I at all want to have a life like they have? No, as, as like arrogant as that sounds, you can't. It's it's better to be a little bit arrogant than it is to let people influence you who are going to make who, where where that influence is going to make your life worse, right? It was even worse in the oil field, but then like in the oil field, I just basically didn't talk to anyone unless it was because I was at work, right? I was very selective with who I, who I would talk to. So yeah, you just have yeah. to take uh, your your goals more seriously than relationships with people who aren't you know, adding any value to your life, right? Yeah, definitely. And again, you kind of mentioned that you had these outside, you know, forces and frictions that people who weren't supporting you and your ability to disconnect. Um, family, they can get away with a few more jabs, generally speaking, you know, with, uh, with some of that stuff. How do you help your clients when maybe they have a, a spouse or somebody who's not necessarily as supportive, you know, I mean, I've seen this both with, with men and women where they start to get in shape, they start to get a little pushback directly from their significant other. How do you recommend navigating that for with like a spouse in that case you have to you have to get a little uncomfortable in the sense that like you have to sit down with them and explain why you're doing it and why it's important to you because if you just start doing it and you kind of i think a lot of it when it comes to with your spouse is they feel threatened by you trying to make the change and maybe it kind of makes their life a little more inconvenient uh and if, if you're not very open with them about like why you're doing it why it's important to you all they're going to see is how it's negatively affecting them. Right. And, and, and understand as well that kind of em emphasize with them, you know, they feel like you're doing something that's going to disconnect them from, uh, from you. Right. Emphasize that first. And then, you know, you're going to have to get ready to have that kind of uncomfortable, like sit down conversation where you have to kind of explain, maybe, maybe it's comfortable for some people, but where you have to explain why this is what you're doing, why it's important to you. 
you know, kind of just ask for their support rather than their pushback, right? Yeah, that's exactly how I like to frame it. Like, hey, I want your support with this, not your permission. Yeah. You know, because I think individually, not to turn this into a relationship talk, but like if you're not allowing that person who you're with to elevate something that could be, you know, related to their health because it makes you not feel good. Like, are you truly supporting and being the partner that you should be in that? Might be a rhetorical question, but I say hell no, right? And, and to me, that's one of the things I least like to see when it comes to that process. Got a little bit sidetracked, but I think that ties in really well because so much of this process when it comes to being able to add substantial muscle like you have comes to first being open, receptive to doing something different when you're already in great shape. Mm -hmm. It comes down to being able to give somebody else kind of the, the steering wheel, so to speak, and go along for the ride and really focusing on it. And then it comes down to being able to stay narrowly focused directly on your goal, even when you have pushback from different areas. Mm. With your diet, you mentioned it's been very much kind of like a classic bodybuilder style. You know, if you've ramped up food gradually, like how, what are the highest that your calories have been throughout this process? They're about like 4,000. And that's kind of been, that's kind of been like where, where they've stayed at the peak of it. Okay. And so with that, you know, how have you been able to stay more consistent? Because one thing you previously mentioned, like you've gone through some different bulks and then you learn every time, but the consistency with a, with building lean muscle is one of the hardest things to really do because eating goes from something that's, hey, yeah, I get to eat more calories to like, this is some serious work. Any habits that you've taken directly to improve that consistency? Uh, well, like I've been doing this for a long time and uh, I've, I've followed diets that are like, like this, like pretty strict and extreme before and then fallen off track. And so for me seeing like, being able to experience kind of both sides of that where I'm like more flexible and I don't really care about like how I look. I'm not really focused on my goals as I am. I'm just on enjoying life versus being strict for me, being able to look back on all that and kind of being able to say like, okay, well, you know what? Sure. Like things are easier when I'm not really focused on it, but I'm not as happy because I'm not, I'm not achieving goals. That's, that's a big thing. So it really depends on you. You got to definitely remember your goals. That's I think the biggest part of it. Cause uh, this diet that I've been on now for the last you know year has been definitely the hardest to stick to by far. It's a ton of food and it's not good. It's not the, the tasty food that you like eating a lot of, right? It's, it's, it almost feels like I have two full-time jobs, like eating six times a day. It takes me like 20 to 30 minutes to get these meals down. So for me, it's just, I remember my goals, right? I'd say that's the biggest thing. And then just, and then just, just the experience over time, right? So yeah, that's, that's basically it is. It doesn't, I, I'm, I'm having an argument with myself every day. Like, am I sure this is what I want to do? But the experience of coming out on the other side, like I, I got a show um, in June and having the experience of coming out on the other side for, you know, usually I just get lean for photo shoots. When you get there, you look back on it and you're like, that was definitely worth it. Like you're never going to, definitely. Regret, you're never going to regret doing something that's hard when you get the reward at the end and you look back, like you're not going to think, oh, I wish I ate a bunch of cake that one night back in January, you don't remember that stuff. And, and the best, the best way to learn that over time is like experiencing kind of both sides of the coin. But yeah, it's, it's really, it really comes down to delayed versus instant gratification. Yeah. And I think when you make these big promises to yourself and stick to a plan, even when you're not quote unquote motivated to do it every single day, every single meal is how you build one increasing levels of discipline, but also a lot of confidence and self-belief that really transfers to different areas of life. And I think that's one of the biggest things that people learn when they go through a, a transformation in the, in the fitness space, right? It's the discipline, the ability to delay gratification beyond the fact that you're literally optimizing your physical vessel and your brain at the same time and being able to perform better every other area. The skills that you develop internally can be transformational across the board. Yeah. Actually, you know, the, one of the big things that pushes me through like the worst days where I really don't want to do it is I think, and like I said, I, I, I oftentimes have thoughts like, is this actually worth it? Like, what am I doing? Those are the moments in time that separate. Like when you look at someone on, and I'm sure like your listeners can re relate to this. You see people on Instagram and you're like, you're like, what, what, what are they doing different than me that, that makes them look like that and makes it and, and, and where I, I'm struggling to, to, to look even close to like that. It's pushing through those moments where you have that voice in your head that's telling you like, what are you doing? This, this isn't worth it. And that, that, yeah. applies, to, that, that applies to, you know, anything in life that's, that's difficult that you want to achieve. Like, especially so it's going to be even more difficult when it comes to business goals. Right. So that's one of the awesome things about fitness is anyone can, can, can make those changes. That's kind of the foundation. Yeah, it really is. It really is. As you've gone through 
not only this physical transformation, but the mental one, like what like biomarkers have you looked at in regards to health? Because hey, listen, you've added a, a ton of weight in a short period of time. What things have you done to really look at and to monitor your health so you can keep it as healthy as you can while still having this big stretch goal? Uh, so I do blood work, full, a full blood work panel every three months. Um, I do blood pressure once a week. I was doing blood sugar three times a week, although uh, my coach has decided that doesn't matter as much anymore because you get that in your blood work. You end up overcorrecting if you if you're if you're yeah. doing it kind of too much. So th those are the three things: blood work, blood pressure, blood sugar. Okay, and so yeah, you look and monitor those. Like any specific like supplementation you've done, you know, for for heart health, cardiovascular, anything like that that was different from when you're leaner. I, I actually started the the supplementation protocol before because like like I, I said I mentioned earlier um, during like the summer of 2022 I wanted to kind of prove to myself that I was able to to stick to it enough to to be able to kind of like fully commit to it um, I think that's part of the reason like I got blood work done and like my testosterone uh, naturally at the time was uh, like 1100 which is a little bit over the natural reference range so I think that was definitely yeah. part of the reason why. But I, I take, like, when I first started working with my current coach, he was like, you're taking way too much stuff. And then at that point, of course, it's difficult to, like, to cut back on it because you don't know, like, what's helping and what's not. Yeah. But now, after he's worked with me for a year, he's like, I think you're kind of onto something there because I've never seen someone gain this much and your health. Like, I just got my bloods done the other day and they're still good. So, but yeah, it's, it's too much stuff to list. <laughs> it's, it's uh yeah, a ton of stuff. Stuff for my heart cardiovascular, kidneys, liver, there, there's a huge list of, of things. It would take me forever to go through it all. I'd say some of the most like important things, NAC quercetin helps with like your, your immune system, helps prevent you from getting sick. Uh, there's stuff I take before bed, like magnesium, zinc. I mean, someone who is not trying to bodybuild to get to a very high level does not, definitely does not have to take that much health supplements. Like you can get away with a good multivitamin, uh, omega vitamin D3, but uh, yeah, definitely the things that I've been taking over the last year, it's a, I probably spend between 500 and a thousand dollars a month on just health supplements. <laughs> yeah. Hey, it's an investment. It's yeah. an investment indeed. Going through this process now, you can reflect back you already had a huge base of knowledge in terms of mistakes that people often make. What are some of the maybe hidden mistakes that people normally wouldn't realize that they're making when it comes to building muscle? First on the training side, there's something that you've learned over the last year that's been really just kind of a mind fuck. Ooh, that's, a, that's a good question. Hidden mistakes. Well, we've covered kind of the big ones like food, uh, training hard, ba uh, balance between volume and intensity and recovery. I mean, the one thing that I've kind of got from my coach that at first I was not really bought into was his emphasis on whole food over like supplements and stuff like that. His theory is like when you eat whole food, so like I said, if it was up to him, he'd have me eating chicken and rice every day. His kind of theory on that, and he knows this isn't like scientifically proven, but because you have to digest, you know, solid food. And it takes a little bit longer than if you were to drink a protein shake um, or have you know carb supplement, whatever. It sits in your stomach for a little longer. It gives you your body more opportunity to draw nutrients from it. So that makes sense. That's one thing. Although you know, like for lifestyle clients, I'm not gonna. I wouldn't push anyone to eat as much whole food as I'm eating now. But yeah, when it comes to hidden mistakes, it's really just the the, the main things are the main things, right? But I mean, I mean, sleep is big. Uh, I think uh, one of the good ones that we covered earlier was like keeping the quality of your of your diet high, not having a bunch of cheat meals. Can't really think of any other hidden mistakes. I think we were pretty thorough when we went through the main drivers. Yeah. Well, I mean, the big thing that stood out to me, this is somewhat of my experience as well, has been the decrease in training volume, but the big overall emphasis on the intensity and pushing things mm -hmm. to muscular failure obviously doing that within a safe boundary. And then of course the natural food component. I think a lot of people have this conception that, yeah, you are taking a lot of supplements for, for health, but you've got a lot of other stuff going on. It's a different level of commitment for what you're trying to do. Whereas I think a lot of people first start looking at, Hey, I want to build muscle. Hey, I want to lose fat. What supplement should I take? And it's yeah. like, that, those aren't the things that matter. Like those are the 1% details that need to be optimized on the very end. And I think a lot of times people look to optimize things that they're not yet consistent with on the basics. And that's why ultimately success comes from a ruthless execution of the basics, not trying to find this one tweak or one, one thing. It's about just getting better and more consistent across the board. Yeah, actually, you know what? One just came to me, uh, cardio. So like I mentioned earlier, um, 
the number one thing that will help you build more muscle than you've ever built in the past is giving yourself runway, right? So we talked about that in the context of starting as lean as you can. Uh, and another thing that'll help you keep, help, help keep you lean as you build the muscle is doing cardio. Now in the past, without a coach, there's no way I'm doing cardio when I'm bulking, right? But um, my coaches push me harder than I pushed myself on cardio when I was super shredded. So 10,000 steps a day for me at least, and then doing Stairmaster inter intervals four times a week. Um, so that, that'll help keep you healthier. That'll help keep you leaner as you do it. So I think that's a big hidden one that, you know, in the past, if we were talking two years ago, I would have said, don't even, you don't even have to do cardio when you're, you're in fat loss. And that's, that's true from like a pure fat loss, muscle growth perspective. But when you kind of get more into the weeds and I think it helps a lot if you just, if you stay on the cardio. Yeah. Maybe it helps for everything from you know, energy substrate utilization, which in other words, how well your body breaks down all the food that you're having. Mm -hmm. And of course, cardiovascular health, you know, something like that's always important. So yeah, I love it. All right. So big question for you. You've been photo shoot shredded. Now you're huge. What has been a harder process building muscle or losing body fat? Building muscle by a landslide. And is it primarily based on the duration that it takes and just the amount of consistency with it? Yeah. And the amount of like how uncomfortable it makes you feel like it's, it's affected 24 hours a day. It, it makes life harder, uh, at least to the level that I've taken it. And even, even before when I was doing it on my own and not taking it as seriously, same thing. You don't, you don't feel as good. You feel heavy. You feel groggy. It's always harder for me to wake up in the morning when I'm at my leanest. I feel the best by far. Like there, there's something about constantly being, having hunger that just, you know, makes me at least feel, feel much better, uh, much more focused, easier to focus on work. So like night and day, I I'm, I'm, I'm so happy that I get to start cutting again. In January. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great perspective. That's a great perspective. Indeed. Brandon, thank you so much for joining the look right naked podcast. Where can we find out more about you? Uh, so coach Brandon Hale on at coach Brandon Hale on Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok, And then of course, just my name, Brandon Hale on Facebook. Perfect. Guys, that Brandon, Coach Brandon Hale at Instagram, it's a great follow. You do not pull any punches. You are 100% you to the core, and I absolutely love it. So make sure you give him a, uh, a follow, ask him a question, and check out his content. Awesome, dude. Had a great time here. Hey, it's Eric here again. Now, there are three ways that I can help you look great naked. Number one, if you want to grab a free copy of the Look Great Naked Protocol to help you lose body fat without counting calories, then go to bachperformance.com backslash free training. Number two, if you're a busy guy looking to build muscle, then I recommend checking out our Minimalist Muscle Blitz, which has helped over 1,000 men build muscle without living in the gym. Just go to minimalistmuscleblitz.com. The link will also be available in the show notes. Or number three, and last, if you want to work with me directly and get the best results possible, apply at bachperformance.com backslash coaching to look great naked without living in the gym. Until next time, my friend, 